Hello, everybody. This is Pastor Brad. Thanks for joining us again on this Wednesday night for our Bible study as uh, we are going through the little book, Rabbi, Teach Us to Pray. Uh, I hope as uh, we prepare to do that this evening that things are going well for you. Just know that you are being prayed for, you are loved and appreciated, and uh, just thank you for being a part of our little fellowship uh, here at uh, Pleasant View First Baptist Church. And if you're not part of our fellowship, but maybe you're joining us tonight for this study, you are, are completely welcome. We are so glad that you're here. And we would love to know that if you're ready to let us know that. And you can do that by filling out the little online card. The link is below. We would love to hear from you. Also, you can use that card for prayer requests uh, or, or whatever you might want to communicate to us. Well, tonight we cover part three of Abby's book, Rabbi Teach Us to Pray. And he's titled this, The Hour of Prayer, How the Daily Times of Prayer Can Transform Our Lives. Now, here's what Ebby says at the beginning of chapter 3. God orchestrated this world with a natural rhythm. He declared that the sun, the moon, and the stars would be for signs and seasons and for days and years. Now, he gets that from Genesis chapter 1, the beginning of creation, where God said, Genesis 1:14, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And to this day... Those are the things that determine our calendar. Every day, every month, every year, every spring, every summer, every, win every winter and fall is, is all associated with the stars and the constellations and the rotation of our, of our planet and the orbiting of our planet around the sun. We see God's schedule and rhythm and displayed in all its glory. And one of the things that shows us is that God loves order. Ebby calls this the rhythm of creation. I love that. Rhythm and order wasn't just infused into uh, creation. God made sure it was fused into the, the life of the Israelites, into their calendar. They were commanded to observe yearly festivals or feasts. And uh, that's found in Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, I'll let you read that on your own. I'm just going to skim over it. But Leviticus 23 talks about the feast or the festivals of the Lord. It begins with the Sabbath. Don't forget the Sabbath. That's a weekly rhythm that you're to be uh, uh, involved in where you rest and don't do anything. It's a holy day. And then another was the yearly Passover, which is associated with Israel being delivered from their bondage in Egypt and Moses and the plagues and all those kind of things. Uh, and the angel of death passing over those who had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their homes. There was the feast of the first fruits, which had to do with the harvest. There was the feast of weeks that was commanded. There was the feast of trumpets that they observed. There was the day of atonement where the sins of the people was forgiven and all of the sins were put on, on uh, the lamb or the goat. Uh, there was the Feast of Booths, also known as the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, that they were to celebrate. And so the whole chapter uh, is about these uh, celebrations, these rhythms that were to be woven into the daily lives of the Israelites. And then the final verse is, Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel the appointed feast of the Lord, and Jews to this day observe those feasts in some form or fashion. So the word feast here, also translated as festival, uh, according to Ebi, is from the Hebrew word moed, which means appointment or meeting. Now this may sound strange to us, but many Christians have started observing these holy days because they all in some way point to Jesus. Of course, the, the Passover points to Jesus because Jesus is our Moses who has delivered us from the bondage of sin. Um, even, even the Sabbath, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath and we find rest in Him. The Feast of Booth or Tabernacles. The Bible says in John chapter 1 that, that Jesus is God tabernacling with us. Uh, and then the Day of Atonement when, when Christ died on the cross uh, to, to pay for our sins, the Lamb who was slain. You, you see the connections there. So very appropriate for Christians to observe those. I've never personally done that but I, I've admired it and, and have thought for a long time that I might want to. I've just never followed through. Well, not only were there annual feasts, there were the daily appointments uh, that were woven into the lives of the Jews. Uh, Numbers 28, 1 and 2, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the people of Israel and say to them, My offering, my food for my food offerings, my pleasing aroma, you shall be careful to offer to me at its appointed time. 
Now, I'm going to read now from the book uh, in chapter 3 on page 24 where Ebby comments uh, about this verse and its meaning to the Jews. It says, This passage goes on to describe a burnt offering that was to take place twice each day. Each offering consisted of a lamb, grain, and wine. The priest offered one in the morning as the first sacrifice of the day. The other, the last sacrifice of the day, took place in the afternoon, although some Bibles say twilight or evening. Uh, afternoon is the more accurate interpretation. Like the annual festivals, this twice daily sacrifice was to take place at an appointed time. This phrase comes from the same Hebrew word moed as before. As the priests were to be careful about offering them, the timing of these sacrifices was clearly important to God. In establishing these daily appointed times, God built a rhythm of worship into each day. Now think back to what we've already learned about the sacrifices made to God by the Jews. What spiritual act was it closely associated with? Prayer. Yeah, as the Israelites made these daily offerings, they poured their hearts out to God in prayer. And when they weren't able to make these offerings, whether, it was in, whether they were in exile or whatever, the prayer was still to be offered in substitute. These times came to be known as the hour of prayer for the Jews. Ebi says that in addition to morning and afternoon prayers, ancient Jews also started praying in the evening inspired by Psalm 134, verses 1 and 2. Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. Now, Ebi clarifies that we can pray any time during the day, but that's when the Jews do so. Now, the Old Testament talks about these times of prayer. Psalm 55, 17, Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. Uh, even though the Jews were eventually exiled from Israel because of their rebelliousness and taken into the lands of their captors, which made sacrifices at the, at the temple impossible, which I already mentioned, they were still able to offer the sacrifice of prayer. The prophet Daniel lived in Babylon during one of those exiles. The Babylonian king, Darius, signed a decree that all in his land could only pray to him. Yet Daniel was unmoved. He went to his house and opened the windows facing Jerusalem. Uh, that's in Daniel 6.10. And when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open, open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. And so there's an example of how the Jews had incorporated the, these hours of prayer into their lives in morning and afternoon and evening. Now you fast forward to the time of Jesus and we see people praying in the morning at the temple. Luke 1.10, and the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. We've already observed how Jesus rose early to pray. Mark 1.35, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. Now, I've always, now that's always truly impressed me, obviously, um, but I've always attributed that getting up before the sunrise and praying the sunrise in um, uh, to just Jesus being Jesus as God's Son and all. But I read an interesting article the other day about where Jesus grew up, Nazareth. Archaeologists now believe that city, that town, uh, or settlement, maybe even better to call it, was unusual in that it was a haven for a very orthodox and dedicated segment of Jews known for their holiness and keeping the Jewish customs. Um, Ebby points out that ancient Jewish writings describe a custom of meditating an hour before praying at sunrise. And so I'm wondering if maybe that's not how Jesus was raised uh, to pray as he was brought up in that little town, that little settlement that seems to be especially uh, uh, fervent in its worship of God. Regardless, daily prayers were important to the Jews. Uh, in the book of Acts, the disciples, the Messianic Jews now, went to the temple for afternoon prayers, Acts 3.1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Uh, 
The ninth hour would have been around 3 p.m. This was the same day a non-Jew, a Gentile, was praying one day, Acts 10.30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. That's a beautiful story. Uh, look at that when you get, chan get a chance. We know, Con we know Cornelius was a God-fearer. That means he was a Gentile who converted to Judaism just short of being circumcised. And he, he even he incorporated into his life as a Gentile who converted to Judaism these hours of prayer. Now let's skip over to where Evie writes about Jesus' sacrifice and how it relates to the daily prayers. So uh, look in your books if you've got the book on uh, page 28. Uh, let me just uh, read this a little bit longer section, but it's really good and I just want to share it with you. Ebby writes, The sacrifices of the temple beautifully prefigure the suffering and death of the Messiah. This is true not only regarding the Passover lamb the ancient Jews roasted and ate at their Passover meals. All the many sacrifices and offerings connect in some way to the atoning suffering and death of Messiah. For example, the sacrifices involve the shedding of blood, and they also have a certain ability to purify and draw one near to God. Beyond this, there is a remarkable correspondence even in their timing. Mark 15, 25, it was the third hour when they crucified him. Jesus was placed on the cross at the third hour. The third hour corresponds to the conclusion of the morning sacrificial service, this rhythm of sacrifice and prayer we've been talking about that was part of the life of the Jews. It was the time of day when, 50 days later, the disciples gathered on the festival uh, known as the Festival of Pentecost in Acts 2.15. Uh, and then we look back to the crucifixion. When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. That's Mark 15, 33. Darkness covered the land at the sixth hour. The sixth hour corresponds to the time of the additional festival offering. Jesus died at the time of Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. As with all the festivals, an additional offering was prescribed for this time. Uh, in the Mark 15, 34, at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus died at the ninth hour of the day. His death corresponds to the daily afternoon offering, the final sacrifice of each day. After this offering, the doors of the sanctuary were closed. Even the evening prayer reflects Jesus' suffering in some way. It was at night that he was arrested, accused, and beaten. This correspondence suggests that by praying at the times of sacrifice, we are in a sense memorializing the Messiah and his suffering on our behalf. You know, Ebby there just blows my mind when he talks about how that rhythm of prayer that was part of the lives of the Jews was displayed in the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus and the timing of it all. And what a way to look at our prayer life and think about that if we were to somehow incorporate that into our prayer times, we would be corresponding with what our Lord went through on the cross. That is really humbling. So finally in this chapter, Ebby draws everything together as he explains how the Jewish practice of daily prayer carried forth into Christian practice in later centuries. Uh, the Didache uh, is a book written in the first or second century uh, as a manual for early Christians. It contained teachings on living the Christian life, and it instructed Christ followers to pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day echoing that practice of the Jews. So I just want to finish this study, which I think I'm not timing it right now, but it may be a little bit shorter than some of the other ones. But uh, I want to finish with what uh, Ebby talks about here uh, at the end. Ebby writes about how this practice that was um, communicated in the Dake uh, was, uh, has, has evolved. He says, over time, this practice evolved into the canonical hours still practiced by Catholic and Orthodox churches. Yet when Paul spoke of these, he was referring to the prerogatives of the Jewish people, Romans 9, 4. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, literally service, and the promises. That is not to say that Gentiles cannot participate in this pattern of worship as well. It is just that when they do, they are participating in something Jewish. 
They are joining in, reverberating with, and responding to the rhythm and pace set by the Jewish people. As the earth spins on its axis, these daily appointed times flow across its surface like rippling waves. As they sweep over each town and city, Jewish people assemble in synagogues and enthrone the name of God in unison. These waves have been circling the earth continually for thousands of years. When disciples of Jesus join in with this chorus of worship, we have the opportunity to infuse it with the power of the name of the Messiah. So daily prayer was, is, woven into the lives of Jews in a big way more so than most Christians that I'm aware of, and just to be honest, certainly more so than me. I don't know about you, but it, it's pretty intimidating when I think about how the Jews have incorporated that rhythm of prayer into their life, so much so that three times a day they set aside times uh, to just focus on uh, and worship and pray to the Lord, which is a form of sacrifice makes me wonder if I need to get serious about prayer and start praying an hour three times a day like our Jewish friends. Um, However, I've talked before about how we have to be careful about that. Praying more is never a bad thing, but there's a danger that we'll do it more as ritual, a checking off the list, and less as an act of love and devotion towards God. Pride is the stealth bomber of sins, and uh, we might even be able in, in our discipline to do like our Jewish friends and pray three hours a day in the morning, even maybe before the sunrise, and maybe in the afternoon, and then in the evening before we go to bed. And if we are able to do that, that's awesome. But there's always that danger that it will become an issue of pride for us, and we will make it more a ritual and and, and an act of, of following a code or law and, and less an act of devotion towards God. It won't really be a heartfelt sacrifice. Prayers offered that way aren't a sweet-smelling aroma to our Father in heaven. I think our takeaway from the rabbis should be trying to model what they teach us about prayer in principle. I think we need to model what the Jews show us in principle. How can we weave the rhythm of prayer into our daily life? How can we make it part of the natural ebb and flow of what we do like eating and sleeping? And it still be meaningful and thoughtful and heartfelt. And so I guess maybe that's what we need to pray about this week. To say, Father, help me to make prayer part of the rhythm of my life. And folks, if we can do that, and if we can begin to make prayer part of the rhythm of our lives, it truly will be transformative. Well, hey, listen, that's it for tonight. Thanks for joining us. I hope uh, maybe uh, this little book is blessing you. I know it's blessing me. Uh, Again, if you have a prayer need or something or need to communicate something, please don't hesitate to to use the online card or you can even text our church phone number uh, or send us an email at uh, info at pvfbc.com. Uh, I love spending time with you, even if it's uh, this way, uh, not face to face. Again, we're hoping to be back together soon. Uh, I love you guys. I'm going to pray uh, and then I'm going to close. And for those of you that are part of our church family uh, and have access to our uh, private Facebook group page, the, the uh, link for the Zoom prayer meeting is there tonight. I hope to meet you there. If you'd like to be a part of that, just email me uh, and I'll be glad to get you connected. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word and what it teaches us. Thank you the, for the example that the Jews set for us, Father. Um, Jesus came to the Jews first and then to us Gentiles. And I pray that we might make prayer part of the rhythm of our lives. I pray that for myself. Thank you so much for Jesus and His love for us. And thank you, God, that we can trust you. Thank you, Father God, that you are always near to us, especially during times of trouble. And we just do pray, Father, for all those that are suffering and hurting and going through hard times right now, that they would sense your presence. And Lord, just... Get this to over, make this be over soon, Father. And uh, until then, Lord, I pray for strength. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Love you guys. Good night.